Welcome to my presentation. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank the organizers of FlowCon 2022 for inviting me to give this talk. So before I start this presentation, I would like to introduce myself also a bit. So where do I come from, what I'm currently doing? So what I'm currently doing is quite easy. I'm a teacher at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich, as well as a CEO and the CISO of the organization. My team um, of researchers, we are looking mostly into cyber defense topics. So my research is mostly about attack, attention, uh, digital forensic, malware analysis, and cyber threat intelligence. And this is also where I come from. I used to be a principal security engineer at the Siemens Corporate Technology for almost 12 years and was heading the Siemens CERT. So with those two roles as operational but also research, I had a deep look into the whole topics. Further, I was on the board of the Forum of Internet Response and Security Teams, also called FIRST, and was the chairman from 2017 until 2019. So I've seen a lot over the years, and now I'm quite happy to give this back to my students so that they can learn from my experience. So when I got invited to give this uh, presentation, I was thinking about what should I talk about? Should I talk about what I'm currently doing in research or what are the current developments in our area? And I was a bit, yeah, skeptic about that because for me keynotes should be something different so they should be entertaining and entertainment i'm a german so my jokes are really bad so entertainment is not really what i can do for you today so then i thought further what can what should be a keynote about so for me it was always something inspiring something where i learned a lot from people who are in the field for a longer time than I used to be. And so Skino should give a, uh, an insight into what's currently happening in an area or where we see a changes in the research is necessary or people need to think about that. So I thought about, okay, what are really the interesting topics for us? And for me, always a topic which was to my heart, something interesting was network intrusion detection. Why that? First of all, I love networks. Networks are really complex and it's a lot of engineering mindset necessary to build up great network environments and even more co complex to, the attack, uh, to detect attack in it. So I thought about why not look into the whole topic of network intrusion detection? So the first thing which came to my mind was, is net not network intrusion detection not really dead? And with this presentation, I would like to give you an overview why a lot of people are thinking that network intrusion detection is something which is not really worth looking into, and then give you the as a other perspective that's in my mind an even more important topic than it ever used before. But before that, we need to look into why people think network intrusion detection systems are dead. So around 2010, 2011, a lot of have, has happened in the field of IT security and um, the leaks of Edward Snowden showed that there is a, U, a massive monitoring of in our internet infrastructure happening. And security engineers have an answer to that. And the answer was end-to-end -end encryption. Something which we already told our managers and companies, our peers and so on, it's an important topic to have end-to-end -end encryption. So from a security mindset perspective, this is really where we want to go. What does end-to-end -end encryption mean? End-to-end -end encryption means that a particular system will talk end-to-end -end encrypted with another uh, uh, end system. And even there are systems between this communication channel, those systems are not able to read and decrypt this, uh, this information. So end-to-end -end encrypted. This will solve a lot of problems in our field. So how did we go there? So first of all, one of the more important developments was 
that we are using now, not uh, plain text HTTP. So HTTPS was around for many, many years. So what is that? what is actually HTTPS? HTTP, for sure you all know, is a protocol used to trans, uh, trans, uh, transfer uh, website in, uh, information. And HTTP grew, uh, got, got more and more important. We added more features into, into it. We now have real-time communication with, R, with web RTC. We have uh, streaming. We have mostly everything which in HTTP. So in around uh, in the 1990s, uh, Netscape thought back then, okay, HTTP is nice, but transferring credit card information in uh, plain text is not maybe the best thing to do. So they started developing something which is called SSL, which later on transformed to TLS. And HTTPS is nothing else than HTTP with TLS in the background. It's more complicated, but from, from, from our understanding, that's what we really need to, uh, need to know about. So HTTPS was around now for a long, long time. However, not a lot of people readapted it. It was mostly used for sensitive information. But yeah, most traffic was still in blank text via HTTP. So that was really helpful for us security people uh, who are more from a defense side looking into topics. Why that? Quite easy, we looked at HTTP for detecting a text. How do we do that? So for example, the time I was still doing attack detection, we used to use network intrusion detection systems to identify botnet traffic. So most malware authors did not implement any TLS encryption or HTTPS decryption, uh, 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 encryption. They mostly used plain text HTTP and they had particular uh, yeah, strings we needed to look for in the payloads they were sending, so we can we were able to write signatures for our network intrusion detection systems and easily detect those, those malicious communication and identified end system who were affected with um, with this botnet or with different malware. So quite cool for us. So that was mostly what what was around, but. With all the leaks coming out that we need now encryption more and more, it changed a bit. So, for example, Google had a huge impact into the development we can see. And what Google did is they forced to use HTTPS more and more. One example was that websites which were encrypted with HTTPS by default were ranked higher on the search uh, on the search uh, Google search. Um, List so search uh, websites with uh, with HTTPS by default were were maybe not the best fit for the question you ask for, but they were entire because of HTTPS. So for a lot of website operators, that meant hey, we need to implement HTTPS. Also with Google Chrome and other browser vendors like Fire Mozilla Firefox, they pushed more that HTTPS came default. But there was one, uh, one part of the puzzle which was missing, and that was PKIs. So what, used, what PKI operators were doing in the last years was mostly have a monetary business model about that. So they offered certificates not for free, but they knew to, you need to pay for it for, for example, two to three years of lifespan of the certificate. And it was a hugely manual task. So we needed to go there and implement HTTP, um, certificates on every system. And that took us a long time. So with recent developments which were happening, this changed. So currently we don't have any more uh, certificates or we still have mail deployed certificates, but the vast majority of the internet now are using automated protocols so that the certificates get, uh, get implemented and so on. So um, with the this helped us a lot in that. And a huge, a huge part of this puzzle was the Certificate Authority Let's Encrypt with their protocol ASME. So ASME and Let's Encrypt totally changed what we're kind of seeing. And now if you look on the latest statistics about how much websites we have with HTTPS implemented as default, the number is going up and up and up. And I think at a certain point, we will never hit 100%, but I think 
a good 90% we were able to, to uh, uh, we were able to hit, and that's a really important um, effect which we are, uh, which we are having. That HTTPS is becoming the de facto standard for us on the internet, and this will also help us security defenders that the communication for the constituency we are protecting is help uh, is put uh, is better protected. Another game changer in this whole encryption uh, topic was the so-called RFC 8446. So think about it. Do you know what 8446 is? Let's go to it's easy. It's TLS version 1.3. So TLS version 1.3, okay, so that's just another TLS version. Mm, that's not really true. So TLS up to version 1.3 did not change too much. So too much is maybe a bit uh, problematic to say because there were huge developments happening and a lot of ciphers were, were uh, generated and really, really uh, more, way more um, a better people than I am looked into the whole protocol and further developed it. However, until version 103 there was one problem. It was always backward compatible. So, and that there were a lot of legacy topics in the whole protocol stack. So with version 1.3, the designers of this protocol said, okay, we now want to get rid of all these legacy topics. Because most of the problems we had in the last years were legacy topics, which we needed to in, uh, include in our current version of the protocol. So TLS version 1.3 was a major change to the whole TLS stack and it took a while to develop and enroll it. But currently more and more websites are using it. And TLS 1.3 has a lot of benefits. And the most important benefit for version 1.3 is that um, the, in uh, the interception of TLS traffic is getting way more complicated. So if you are protected with a TLS version 1.3 communication channel, you can be sure if you check your certificates rightfully that interception is most, uh, mostly, mostly not possible. Or if you uh, record the traffic that later on it's very really hard to decrypt it because the algorithms which are used in this protocol are currently not seen as being, uh, as, as being um, attacked easily. So TLS 1.3, uh, another part of the puzzle for better end-to-end -end encryption. So if you're an operator of a network, check your websites if they're already delivering 1.3. And if they deliver 1.0 or 1.1, this error those protocol. So those protocols are dead and should not be used. And not speaking of SSL version 3.0, if you're still running that, you may have problems. So TLS, another piece of the puzzle. Uh, and an important development. So if you look into that slide here, you see yeah, some, something which you may not be, be familiar with. So this is just a common output of a Unix tool called DIC. So what I did is I looked up the A record in DNS for cert.org. That's a question section. And the other section is that for cert.org I get the following IP address. Okay, nothing really spectacular. An IP address and a DNS name is some, it's not really something privately or something which we need to protect, or is it? So DNS by design is always unencrypted. So the client which is asking for a DNS for an IP address or for a different DNS record goes to the resolver. So if the resolver asks and the big uh, the maybe the top level domain so the net server or the root servers to get an answer for that. I don't want to go into deep in the details about how DNS is working, but in the end what you need to know is DNS is always unencrypted. So even with DNSSEC, this is not changing because DNSSEC was designed not with uh, encryption in mind but with integrity and so on and so on. So why is that a problem? Yeah from a from a larger perspective, it's not a problem because, in the end, it's not not something which is yeah from a privacy perspective a big problem because, from a privacy perspective, if you look into all DNS records, why should there be a problem with that? But if you look into the individual person doing DNS legworks, this may change. Why does this change? Because 
an individual person who maybe have some, um, yeah, who wants to look into a complicated topic or who wants to look into something which he or she is not really happy about that others know that this person has, a, maybe a person has a problem and so on. And depending on the DNS lab that this person is doing, it may be something which shows, oh, this person is, in the, is interested in that and that. So DNS, on a larger perspective, is not a privacy problem, but on, a, on an individual perspective, this is a problem. So how, what can you do? Yeah, you can go there and do DNS tapping. So you look into your network in the, into your network and extract all the information about who is looking up which DNS query, uh, which, uh, which DNS uh, uh, name, and what's the, uh, and all the answers. So there are techniques like passive DNS and so on, who which are doing exactly that. From a defender perspective, this tool, this D, having DNS in control is perfect because you will find out, hey, what. Uh, who is looking up those and those uh, domains, and those domains may be some known to be malicious, and then we, we as defenders can look, go into it and look at this client, if this client is infected, and so on. Also, we can control answers. So, there are techniques like the response policy zone, which are helpful to implement DNS, uh, changing the DNS answer. So, let's look at a domain like malicious.com. So we know malicious.com is malicious. So we may want to change the DNS answer to it. So that's not pointing to the uh, cont uh, controlled server by the, uh, by the attacker, but we want to change it to a DNS, uh, to an IP address, which we are in control of. So that we identify, uh, identify systems which are compromised. So perfect tool for us. However, it's not so easy. So it's always this perspective which we have as responders to attacks, whereas people who want to say privacy is important, we want to encrypt it. So there are developments happening from, from the resolver perspective. So between the client and the DNS resolver, we wanted to bring in encryption. How can we do that? So the first of the answers were using something which is called DOT, D-O-T, and it's just DNS over TLS. So as I explained to you before, TLS is an end-to-end -end encrypted protocol, network protocol, and between this TNS tunnel, you can speak whatever you want. So uh, D, uh, DNS over T, uh, TLS is exactly that. So you, st you uh, st connect to your DNS resolver, via a TLS tunnel and then ask via the TLS tunnel about, hey, what is the DNS, uh, the IP address of that domain? The next thing was DNS over HTTPS and DNS over QUIC. QUIC is uh, similar to HTTP, a protocol for transferring web, um, web um, content. And those protocols are by default, as HTTPS is saying, encrypted and to end encrypted as well. Quick, quick is implementing TLS uh, by default. So those two protocols uh, yeah, really assigned a bit with how DNS is working. So it's still DNS, but they have different contents, not like with DNS over TLS. So in this DNS channel, there is still normal D DNS communication ongoing. So DNS answer and the DNS question are a bit differently formatted in those protocols. The most important difference between DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS and DNS over QUIC is that uh, DOH and DOQ are communicating through the port 443 by default, whereas DNS over TLS is using a separate port, uh, uh, protocol port. And that's an important topic because now from our defender perspective, we can detect if this is DNS over TLS communication because they're using one particular port, whereas we don't see any more that happening in DOH and DOQ because those protocols are just regular HTTPS traffic for us. And that makes our life a bit more complicated. So, and lastly, 
I want to talk about something which is um, a really important tool for us all for doing system administration, which is the SSH protocol. SSH, I think all of us know, and this is not a recent development because SSH is around forever and we never complained about it. And I bring this example not up because I wanted to show that, hey, this is a recent development and we need to look into it. It's just an argument that we I've never seen a security defender complaining about SSH, but I've seen people complaining about the usage of, uh, uh, of HTTPS, uh, of uh, encrypted DNS and so on. So why do we see a difference in that? And that's what I would like to talk now about with you. How did the defense committee respond to it? So when all this recent development happening, I, for example, thought about that's correct. I have seen incidents where end-to-end -end encryption or even encryption on the system helped us to mitigate this attack or that the attacker wasn't able to steal information. So it's a wonderful development. But then I went to different conferences or workshops of the defense community and the people complain about it. We are seeing other communication happening over HTTPS with Let's Encrypt certificates. Attackers are using uh, Let's Encrypt to, uh, to, uh, to encrypt data. Uh, we are seeing uh, the usage of DNS over HTTPS uh, from, a mal from a malware perspective and so on. And it was, I, I sometimes had the feeling that people complain that this development should go backward and the, the tools that are built are not used and uh, can be, can't be used anymore. And every time I was asking some of the questions, why do you think this is a problem? It's a very important development we are currently seeing. Why do you complain? So most people complain, but there are a lot of folks uh, also out there who said this is a great development and we need to think a bit different about that. So let's, let's look first about what happened in, in the community to solve the problem. So it's not all the defenders, it's also the law enforcement and regulatory who looked into the topic and said, oh, it's a problem. So what happened was, well, one of the first answers was the Etsy TS1035231. So does anyone know what it is? So I guess not. And if so, uh, you may may have been the, also one of the unlucky person like me who need to look into the standard. So Etsy is a European standardization body and they developed an, a middle box security protocol. Like quite complex. What is a middle box security protocol? So when the standardization of TLS 1.3 happened, a lot of people said, okay, we need to do something about the fact that the interception of TLS traffic is not anymore possible. And the IKF was not really open for that. So I have said, okay, no, we don't do that. We want to have a very good end-to-end -end encrypted protocol, and this is what we are doing. So what Etsy did was they created a framework where a middle box can be placed between the communication channels and intercept this traffic and then decrypt it so people can look into it. So it's a normal person in the middle attack which is designed by default in this protocol. So this protocol may be used by law enforcement, may be used by, by banks who from a regulatory perspective need to do that. From a security engineering mindset, this is a nightmare. Because what happened is that there's a master key for all communication out there, and it's all communication is stored at one central place. That's heaven for attackers. So this was one of the first responses we have seen in the protocols which we which were developed. First, policies were uh, uh, were implemented. So what do I mean with policies? So I still know a discussion I had within my former team when DNS over TLS uh, and DNS over HTTPS were, was implemented by default in Firefox. So I talked to one of the people who 
who was doing the hardening guidelines and looked and he looked at me and said like i think from a uh, i will forbid that from a policy perspective and i will implement a gpo setting set https and http over T, uh, dns over sorry dns over https and dns over tls is not possible and i looked at him and said that's a very bad idea and we had a larger, a longer argument about that. And I totally understand his perspective. His perspective was, hey, look, we implemented so many tools to, circum to, to help us. And now this tool is circumventing our protection. So it's going through our firewalls directly to an HTTP resolver, which is owned by one company and so on. And he was right. From a privacy perspective in the beginning, DNS over HTTP, S of DNS over TLS was not perfect because we had way too few TLS uh, servers. So that meant that those, those protocols change the perspective we have from, uh, uh, from how we do policies. So I said, okay, what is your, what is your solution? So that we still enable this, this protocol, so that we don't, for example, yeah, have a problem with the privacy of our employees, but still have security in mind. So we discussed it, and this, it was a very easy solution about it. Let's build up a DNS resolver, which is enabling us DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTP, and configures this server for being the default in all of our environment. And then we still have all those controls like we can still use techniques like response policy so on and so on from a defender perspective, but enable uh, the good security of this protocol. So just when you think a bit further, you come to search solutions. So policies for building good usage of end-to-end -end encryption are not good security policies. So take that in your mind when you design it. Yeah, and lastly, what happened was that then a movement from network intrusion detection to host intrusion detection is happening. So I still know when I started in, in this field, people told me always, do it on the network. You don't influence systems and resources and so on, and you always see all of that happening. But then several of 180% uh, created a shift to now look into the host and for sure the host has way more information in which is way better for us defenders because we can do correlation easily we have more information about what's happening and also encryption is not really a problem anymore for us because before it's encrypted on a library and so on we can get the information out from the memory and look into it so host intrusion detection systems are helping and we get way more insights. However, there are systems out there which you really can't protect with a host intrusion detection system. So there are proprietary protocol uh, systems, systems which have which has way too few resources running an additional software stack. Or the hits are yeah, influencing the running of the system. So I looked into, when you look into safety critical systems which are running our infrastructure, you don't want to implement an intrusion detection system on that system, and you don't really know if, if, if at a certain point of time this hits, thinks that this safety critical software is doing a malicious action and stops the software to run. This is not something we really, really want to have. So hits is an answer, but not the, the, the golden answer. And so that's not really a good idea. Or having all those in mind, doing SSL interception with policies, you forbid the usage of such end-to-end -end encrypted protocols. And lastly, using host intrusion detection systems. This is not really what you want to have when you're doing attack detection alone. So what do you want to do? Uh, so here's, for example, an, an, a yeah, paper from, um, 
from three people uh, in the Usenix magazine, and they clearly say that end-to-end -end encryption, the uh, violations of end-to-end -end encryption is causing more harm than it really solves the problems we have. So this is one perspective. And what they did is they analyzed uh, the uh, middle box TLS uh, and looked into, hey, what is the out what is the outcome they have with a middle box TLS whereas doing end-to-end -end encryption? So really, uh, really interesting paper uh, to read. So academics are also saying that this is not a good idea. So all of that now comes together what I've just explained to you. And now you're going back to my, pre my first slide where it says network, in network intrusion detection systems are dead. Is that really still the case? And from my perspective, that's not the case. So, and I'll give you now some scenarios where I think network intrusion detection is still important technology which we need to use and further develop. So first of all, this whole topic of in, uh, Internet of Things or IoT. So if you look into an IoT, first thing which comes to your mind is something which is quite easy. It's an, it's a an Raspberry Pi. So I have here a Raspberry Pi and this Raspberry Pi, for example, has even a TPM chip, which is just a student who used for me to do um, Tier, uh, tier uh, certificate enrollment and starting uh, end to end encryption. Great. So I think on this, uh, this is a reason the Raspberry Pi, so I'm even able to run host intrusion detection. But that's not really the standard, the, the, the standard tool which we have when you think about the network of things. So another example for, uh, is if you are in a uh, if in, a, in an area, a rural area, like I am, for example, and want to monitor certain things. For example, I have beehives. And with my beehives, what I want to do is I want to monitor the temperature of this beehive and the weight of this beehives. So these beehives are in the middle of nowhere. There is no power. There is yeah, no uh, mobile, uh, mobile uh, phone coverage. And doing a Wi-Fi uh, connection there, forget it. So what I'm doing is I'm running a protocol which is called LoRa One, and LoRa One, long range one, has one particular important topic. It's it doesn't use it uh, it doesn't have a lot of bandwidth, and it's low power. So my device is running on batteries for years. So now imagine how can I do attack detection with this? That's quite complicated because running an intrusion detection system on, so, on this embedded device, on this Internet of Things device, that's not really helpful because from years running this module with the same batteries, it suddenly comes down to yeah, maybe days, hope maybe days. Because the system is always checking hey, is something happening, is something communicating with a malicious packet and so on. So that's not a good idea. So what I could do is I could look into what's happening on the network. So I can record everything which comes to my Lura one um, gateway and there can do attack detection. So is someone trying to send me malicious packets or someone sending malicious packets to my sensors? So network intrusion detection system helping on the, helping there because in this environment we have re very few resources which we can leverage to do so. And there is also interesting research in that field happening so that we better improve this uh, this, uh, this type of, of communication and and look into what uh, what's going on there. So that's one example. Another example is. Industrial control systems or critical systems. I think you all have re uh, read the news about attackers going to our energy grids, uh, yeah, going to fabrics and trying to uh, manipulate the process of producing something or stealing intellectual property. So it's all these nightmare scenarios which we used to have, which we have seen in the, on, on the cinema screen now are now really happening, unfortunately. So. 
Yeah, the answer would be let's improve the security of those end devices. So if you look into those end devices, these are also mostly not full PCs, which we all know of. Those are embedded systems which are doing a certain task in a safety critical manner. So when you have a PLC, for example, this PLC uh, has, yeah, must run within certain milliseconds that a certain task is done. So when you now have a host intrusion detection system on it, it doesn't really help you because it's influencing the system runtime. So there are concepts that this can be still monitored with coprocessors and so on, but we are not there. And if you look into the lifetime of those yeah, systems, we are talking about 10, 20, 30 years. So we will have for a long time legacy equipment out there. So we need to come up with new ideas. And as, as mostly those protocols who are spoken in the environment are not encrypted, we still can use our network intrusion detection systems. But not out of the box, as those protocols are different to what we computer scientists or computer engineers are seeing, uh, we need to yeah, develop tools which are parsing those protocols and better interpreting that results and also very very more important understand how an attack is looking like. So industrial control systems is an environment where uh, network intrusion detection was always something which people looked into it but it is now coming to more way more importance and there are a lot of companies looking into the whole topic and I think all the researchers are looking into but but from my perspective far too few. There must be more research happening in that field. So then container. And I'm not speaking about the container which you're seeing in this picture. What I'm speaking of are containers which we deploy with our software stacks in cloud environments, in Kubernetes, and what else we have around there. So if you look into containers, the first question I think what comes to your mind is why does Thomas now talk about containers? That's just a Debian or an Alpine Linux running and then there's a software stack on. What is the difference? Yeah. So what I don't want to I don't want to have is that these containers now additionally have an host intrusion detection system and they get deployed wherever they want to have and then I need to collect this information or build yeah build uh, build pipelines which getting this information to my central locking system. So when you further look into how containers are deployed, containers are most likely just exposing the default port out there without any security in mind. So there is no HTTPS by default enabled. What's happening is we are building reverse proxies like Caddy, traffic, or what else is out there in front of those containers, and those are the endpoints from the communication. So now we have an endpoint for our encrypted communication, and we have the containers behind it. So what is the yeah the solution for monitoring attacks within this environment? Quite easy. Let's deploy a network intrusion detection system as well as a container in this, in this environment and record the traffic which is going through the reverse proxy to the different containers and collect it and send it to our central system. That's just one idea uh, to, to help here. And then we can leverage all this knowledge we've built up over the last 30 years in network intrusion detection systems and, and use it there. And so this is nothing new. This is something which is which is already done. I just want to give you this idea further because maybe you haven't heard about it. Then, in recent years, there was there was people, very smart people, looking into, hey, can we do something about fingerprinting encrypted traffic? So fingerprinting encrypted traffic. What does this re What is it about? So I'll give you an idea. So a malicious software is building their own, yeah, are doing their own TLS encryption. 
And the way this TLS encryption is started with the server is quite unique. So it's unique because the cipher suites which are used are in a certain order, or the, the messages which are sent are in this, or the fields of the protocol are sent in a certain order, and so on. So meta information about this about the encrypted uh, uh, communication. So, and people from Salesforce said, hey, can we do TLS fingerprinting on that? And what they developed is two tools, which one is called JA3 and JA3S. One is for the client part and one is for the server part. And what they're doing is they do TLS fingerprinting. So the fingerprint, the signature of the communication starting uh, from a client perspective and from the server, communicate, server part. And then they can say, identify, hey, is this is regular traffic or is this is malicious traffic because it's used by a botnet or is it Tor traffic and so on. So TLS fingerprinting is one idea. So with this concept in mind, the same people developed something similar for SSH. So SSH fingerprinting, uh, they, did with a, uh, they did a tool which is called uh, HASSH. So what they're doing there is that they can identify if this is a if this, uh, if this communication which is just starting is a normal communication which is regular, or if someone, for example, is trying to do uh, password guessing, or if it's an unregular traffic, uh, if it's unregular communication, it's just happening because they say, hey, uh, this client normally does not connect to this server and so on. So. Fingerprinting is one idea, and I think there is way more potential into the whole topic of fingerprinting, uh, and there are more papers out there already, already about that topic. I just come up with those two because those two are used in the real world. And from my perspective, fingerprinting is something which, young, uh, with, with, which researchers can look into it and can get way, uh, way more uh, interesting results out. Then machine learning. So this is something which should not be missed at any at any talk currently. I didn't want to say AI because that's for me just a buzzword, but so ML. So what does ML help us? Yeah, again, ML can help us in identifying traffic. Um, yeah, it can help us identifying which part, type of traffic it is, but also I, uh, we have, can have ideas like, can we detect with machine learning abnormal traffic behavior? So that so a user is, kind of, is suddenly starting abnormal, uh, abnormal behavior, like there's a uh, periodic communication happening, even if it's encrypted and so on. So with different machine learning approaches, we can identify yeah, malicious behavior of a system from a network perspective, even the traffic is encrypted. And I, and I just looked into some re uh, papers recently and also old papers which show, hey, this field is something which we already looked into that and there's interesting research happening, but most of this research has not really made it to, to, uh, to uh, yeah, into real production. There are startups doing that, but what I know, especially in the industrial environment, not much is happening. So machine learning, from my perspective, is a tool which can be used in that, uh, in that field. And then they're always forgotten. So, and they're always forgotten is for me NetFlow. So for those who are not familiar with NetFlow, and I doubt that this is really the case, um, NetFlow is an, a protocol developed by Cisco or another protocol a format developed by Cisco where you can record network communication, uh, where you can rec uh, record network communication on a meta-level perspective. And like when I was beginning in the field 2005, NetFlow was really an important tool. So there were people from DFN search, a German research network search, developer Comentis as an early prediction system. There were people from Switch search, the, the uh, research network of, of Switzerland. And, and all of those looked into, hey, what can we do with NetFlow and detect it? And they further developed it and they are really interesting uh, interesting, uh, uh, interesting tools coming out, especially also at Third CC, who are hosting this conference. With Yaf, they have a very powerful tool uh, uh, to, uh, doing network analysis. So, and for me, so 
NetFlow is, is an, an hidden champion. So you may not you may not detect perfectly attacks, but you can detect, for example, uh, yeah, you can predict denial of service attacks because suddenly you have a slow increase of, of traffic or you can look into particular communication channels and so on. So however, when I'm talking with, with especially younger uh, uh, folks in the defense community, they don't even know the tool. So I had hires which told me like they had never heard about it. What is about it? And when I explained it to them, they said, oh, that's really interesting. So they didn't even hear about it. And even when I give my cyber defense lecture at the university, and those people already had network one and network two as, as lecture, say never heard about NetFlow. And for me, NetFlow is something which we should not forget and even further develop or use it in our environment. So I hope I could give you a perspective about why end-to-end -end encryption is important and that we as defenders should not be against it because our tools suddenly are not working anymore and look differently to the topic. So what I did today was I discussed with you about why encryption makes our network-based detection more complicated, but it helps us to secure our networks when we insist of using our tooling in the networks, we are weakening the security. So with standards, what Etsy are doing with middle box security protocols, we have problems on the long term. So we as defenders should not, so, uh, not say, hey, we are against it. We should think out of the outside of the box and come up with new ways detecting attacks even in encrypted traffic. And even we are not able to look into the end system itself because there are constraints doing so. So with that, I conclude my talk and I hope we had good insights into where I think there's a lot of future research happening. And now I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Thanks for sharing with that, Thomas. We've got a handful of questions that have come in, as well as some lively conversation started up over in the Discord. Um, so before I bring in any of the questions from Discord, time dependent, I'd like to go ahead and chat with you a little bit about some of the questions that not everyone may have had an opportunity to see that came in through Zoom. Uh, so the first question from, from Tim, there's substantial, there is a substantial, albeit older, uh, state of the art in interpreting encrypted signals without breaking the encryption by looking at meta information, right? Size and frequency of traffic, uh, apparent endpoints, type of channel, things like this. Now, I know that this doesn't always give us, right, it doesn't give us the explicit content in the same way that breaking the encryption will do. Um, but can you speak a bit to your thoughts about applying this sort of signals method analysis to, to network traffic? Yeah, so it's a very good question. Um, I think it's it's a way forward in certain environments. Like if you look into very controlled environments, server data centers, uh, or mobile, mostly legacy data centers, or uh, if you look into stater or ICS environments, I think there this approach is uh, helpful. If you look more into uh, yeah, office IT or future, future architectures of office IT, I doubt that this work only helps to identify malicious traffic in a scalable way. Uh, but yeah, I, I know mo mo most of that work because from the type of research I have done previously, in this control environment, this is very interesting type of research. Um, and so, yes, for legacy environments, I I, uh, I think it's a way forward. For yeah, if you look into see uh, trust architectures and so on, I I don't know if this is really work. Thanks for that, Thomas. Um, this one. Maybe a little bit, a little bit more direct to answer. Um, Jim asked, "What's the name of the Let's Encrypt protocol?" Uh, ACME, uh, Automated Certificate Management Environment. Uh, my ITF protocol, I don't know, know the RFC, but if you look into ACME or ACME and Let's Encrypt, then you will find that. 
RFC document. Great, thanks. Um, so we've had we've had some conversation going on about you know what constitutes NIDs, what what scoping is, right? Where there are, where there are limitations of applicability, where there are limitations of applicability to the sorts of things that would that would push NIDs out as a successor in terms of visibility. Um, with architectures such as zero trust networking, right, and more remote work, enterprises have very little control over the, the actual networks that are employed by their users. So why are we still talking so much about NIDs in, in this kind of context? How does that play a role still? Yeah, good question. So um, if, if you look into the tradition uh, or in the zero trust architecture, I don't think that NIDs in, in, in the end-to-end -end communication is an important topic anymore. However, uh, we have, first of all, the data centers itself, and the data center itself, they, they may also go in this direction of zero trust. I think, I think we are far away from that. So there are concepts around who are doing that, but not not yet so far implemented. And there we're still talking about uh, uh, reverse proxies, ending the com uh, communication, and you uh, connect to the container. And, uh, and this communication is still interesting. On the other side, and as explained in my in my presentation, there is also this legacy. And there is legacy around for the next uh, decades. Because uh, from where I'm coming from, we are, uh, in the skater or in the industrial controls, we are talking of lifetimes of 13 more years. And so products designed now are not yet zero trust enabled. So we still need to look into this environment. And therefore, I think NITs is, and the NITs are not dead in that part. And those, those uh, environments will be still made zero trust ready, or, or however you want to call that, in a way that there will be gateways deployed and so on. Uh, but still, we need to look into this legacy environments. So, yeah, so it's, uh, I think, the future in that area. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, I certainly understand, right? We're not going to suddenly one night have everybody turn off everything legacy and move to the, the, the newest, most current, most secure ways to approach, to approach handling our communications. <laughs> uh, the, that would be an engineering feat that uh, I think would defy at least my comprehension. Uh, in a similar vein, we had a question about uh, VPN. So we've seen a lot more VPN usage, certainly recently. We've been in lots of remote mm -hmm. footings. Um, a lot of folks have been using VPN for encrypting network traffic in recent years. Um, but you didn't talk terribly over much about, about VPN. Mm -hmm. um, can you share some of your thoughts about the relationship between sort of network intrusion detection in particular, but perhaps more broadly intrusion detection, and, and use of VPNs? Yeah, um, so VP, VPNs, there are a lot of ways deploying VPNs. So what I, I think what we are currently seeing, uh, especially with the whole pandemic going on and people go to the home office, it's more a VPN solution where one, the endpoint line, which is company owned, is dialing in or building up a network a a connection up to the perimeter of the company and then they are in the normal environment. So. Um, for that, for that VPN connection itself, I don't think that this connection must be protected by an NITS or an intrusion detection. Uh, endpoint uh, uh, host uh, intrusion detection is their one, to, uh, one thing to go. However, when the network, uh, uh, when the VPN uh, endpoint ends, then you still have the normal traffic. And so this traffic can be analyzed by network intrusion detection systems as well. So I would see that as a just normal communication uh, ongoing. Therefore, I haven't covered VPN. If you look into newer concepts like what um, Tailscale is doing, um, so as one example, um, that is a bit different uh, game we're playing. Then we have this end-to-end -end encryption, and we need to, again, look into the host intrusion detection topic. OK. Thanks for that. Um, so we've had a little bit of a little bit of a conversation going on in response to this question already, but I'd like to ask ask you for everybody who may not be seeing that conversation just now. How much do we know, and what sort of particulars do we have um, understanding and describing the ways that adversaries are using DNS over HTTPS and mm -hmm. DNS over TLS? Oh, that's uh, a good question, which I don't really. I can't really answer. So I know uh, for several years ago, there were 
people talking about the usage of uh, DNS over HTTPS and DNS over T TLS with malware, but I honestly, I, I haven't followed up that much uh, what's currently happening. Uh, I, sorry, I can't really answer that question. No, no, no worries. And it seems like we've got some, it seems like we've got some, some conversation going on to unpack folks sharing their, their knowledge and experience over in, in the right. Discord breakout as well. So yeah. I can remember some discussions on various uh, conferences, but I, yeah. Sure. I'm very really up on that. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, so there's a question from from Discord, and I'll read it as it is. I mm -hmm. want to make sure I get it right. Um, are you familiar with DNS bugs across the the sharing of IPv4 and IPv6 with a quad A records and the aliasing that can happen, uh, particularly in the context of how complex the IPv6 ecosystem is and tunneling interactions. Okay. Uh, I, honestly, I don't understand the question <laughs> a lot. I think maybe you said it's on Discord, so maybe we can follow up on that question. Uh, I think so. Uh, maybe it's referring to what I discussed about DNS over HTTPS in my talk. But I, yeah, sorry, I maybe the person who's asked the question, we can follow up on Discord on that question okay. because I don't understand sure. it correctly. Sure, we can we can follow up on that on Discord. Um, let me see what um... <laughs> I'm gonna read a comment here and see if uh, see if you want to to respond for a moment to end the conversation okay. here, right? Whether, whether NIDS, and it's edited, should say payload detection, is dead or not, we should be trying to kill it. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> then, then we have an end-to-end -end world how I want, what would like to have it. But I think uh, until that point, it takes a very long time. And there are certain environments where we can't have that uh, network intrusion detection to be dead especially in uh, controlled processes, I doubt there will be end-to-end -end encryption happening. But yeah, I, my engineering dream you mentioned before, that's uh, where I would say, uh, underline this uh, comment. Right. OK, let's, let's see. Don't, I want to make sure that I don't miss any of the questions that came in. Uh, there's a good chat here that I'm sort of going through to make sure that I find and extract questions. Sure. Um, yeah, certainly, right, one of the challenges with, with a constantly evolving application infrastructure is the presence of legacy systems and the ways that observing those, those older systems and those legacy tools simply don't apply in the same way to more modern uh, devices and infrastructure with which they interact, right? And, and IoT, for example, right? You're not going to necessarily get the same sort of end-to-end -end baked in as you, as you can on desktop hosts and things. Um, can you, in our, in our little bit of time that we have left, can you speak to your thoughts a little bit on um, what something like a move to end-to-end -end looks like with such volatile and varied and small uh, devices like IoT mm -hmm. devices? So that's a very good question. Um, I think we, are, we have, so maybe I can uh, talk a bit about what the research my team and I are doing. And so one of the ideas we are currently having in this environment is that we um, say, okay, the, most of the times these IoT devices are very, deterministic in a way that we really know what they're doing. They're measuring maybe uh, uh, um, temperature, humidity, and so on, and then they're transparent. So you should be quite good in detecting misbehavior, uh, which is not really a normal behavior of this device. And this can be done in in that on that system. However, so, uh, so systems are resource constrained. So we can't yeah, to install a full uh, host intrusion detection system and say, hey, this is misbehavior. We need uh, maybe 
uh, a compiler who is compiling the code which we're putting on the device and that's adding some detection that. So this is something which we look into and we think it's promising. So this is totally different to what I just discussed that NITS is say something which is interesting there. I would say uh, NITS in that context is maybe a um, supporting system that you uh, next to what's happening on the host institution uh, on the host system you also see what is what behavior is on the network and that can be meta information for example and then you may also combine that information and find out if there is adversarial behavior ongoing lateral, lateral behavior and so on so i think that's yeah or no not i don't and i'm not thinking i uh, this is what we are looking into and yeah so that's yeah i think what what work past can be in the future of set environments Thanks. Thanks for that, Thomas.